Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. Let's have some fun today. The main idea of this show is to provide a forum for you guys, the listeners and viewers, to ask questions about chess and the chess world. You can send these question, questions in advance, which is often better, and I'll try to give those a little bit of priority even, because if you send them in advance, they can be carefully worded, they can be long, because you can do it by email, and so you can actually send quite a, a lengthy uh, question with uh, that has maybe a lot of moves in it and accuracy to it. So, But it's also fun to just ask them right here on the chat. The email that you would send them to is askimwatson at chessclub.com. That's A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. You can, if you're an ICC member, you can also message me at my handle, uh, John L. Watson, that's L as in lion, so J-O-H-N-L-W-A-T-S-O-N, or as I say, you can ask questions right now live for the first time in ages. I don't see anybody specifically on the chat, so I wonder if my chat's set up properly, but uh, please pop on and uh, say something so I can see if that's working. Um, Okay, I'm going to assume that there are people watching who are not on the chat. Let me just see for a second if I've got the view right. Anybody who's on there, give me, send me a little message so I can see if that's working. Um, hmm. Live chat. Let me just see. Maybe I should pop out the chat. Okay. Okay. Hmm. There we go. All right. So let me, um, without further ado, get started on some things. I have a bunch of things from uh, last week that I wanted to touch on as quickly as possible. One thing is just a correction, a point of information. The open Rui Lopez Riga game, Riga variation game that we showed last week was actually played, according to the chat anyway, by Dennis von Akena. I apologize to Dennis for not realizing that and not Jonathan Russell. I, I had thought that Moving Dutchman, which is apparently Dennis's name, uh, was Jonathan. But uh, anyway, I hope I got it right this time. Um, really fun game, wonderful game. Um, I also missed, let me see, this question in the chat, I just sort of went right by it. I didn't actually see it. It's a good question because it, it segues into another question that I got this week by, by email. Um, it's from Tomek uh, Durasov. He says, what's your opinion of the QGA? That's the uh, Queen's Gambit accepted. It is not often recommended, and I don't know why. The main lines with knight f3 and e3 are okay for black, in my opinion, and after 3, e4, e5, black is doing okay. So let's look and see what he's talking about. I think he's right that it isn't being played as much as it used to be on really on all levels, and particularly by strong players. They aren't playing it as much as they were. I mean, Kasparov even played it for a while, so really... Well, over the years, many strong players have played it. Uh, it's a little out of favor right now. And I, you know, checked some statistics and looked at some things. Not, it's not totally clear why. Now, he mentions that e4 is, uh, he's not, doesn't think he's doing that much because of e5. And that's, you know, been played for many years. It's actually the most common response for black. And I guess I agree. I think black can probably do okay. Or maybe white can play for a little advantage in some of the main lines. But there's a lot of flexibility for black. And this may be a disincentive. What I noticed also is that, well, there are two things. One is very obscure, but this bizarre move, <laughs> this strange move, just intending to counterattack on the center, um, it's actually been doing pretty well. Uh, and, and this was in correspondence chess, so that made me think, well, gee, maybe maybe that's a reasonable move these days. Another thing is one of my old favorite moves, this move, seems to be working pretty well, too. Um, it's kind of like a Jagoran defense, but in some ways a little better for black. There's an immediate attack here. And uh, it can be a slightly improved ver version of the knight f6 lines because white has to commit to playing something first. And if he plays here, for example, you have this move. And, um, and then you can play very simply. Uh, for example, after a move like that, you can just develop. There are other moves, but you can just develop. And then you can take here and force him to double his pawns because if queen takes, uh, black simply takes the d pawn. So even this nice E6 line, and then I like this move. There are other moves that have been played, but this one really I like. Are you ready to castle queen side? A little bit of pressure there, a little bit of pressure there. 
uh, I think it's a fun line. So I, I, maybe that maybe that discourages people. Maybe it doesn't. There are other maybe better ways for white to answer it. But I think I've looked at them all, and I think black's fine. Um, so let's say that that's true. Then the next thing to say would be what 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 what's why isn't white playing this? And he mentions the main lines that basically go like this. One of the old main lines has been played more often than anything else is just to recover the pawn like this and have a central majority. That's two to one pawns in the center. And um, the main line goes something like this. Now there's plenty of side lines. I think we've even gone over a few of them in this show, I think. At, at any rate, um, they're all somewhat better for white. Uh, all, I think all the little side lines tend to be a little bit better for white. Um, but, but, you know, they're maybe playable for black. Um, okay, and now black usually counterattacks in the center. This position's come up so, so often. And white has various setups here. Let's castle first. Um, and black has various setups, but the most popular move by far is this move. Uh, and that's because this isolated pawn position has proven a little difficult to play for black. This kind of position is a little bit difficult. Uh, we've talked about this kind of position, and we're going to get we're going to look at something like that in, in a game. So that'll be fun to, to see. Uh, but it won't be exactly like this. It'll actually be a slightly better version for black, I think. Um, so the main move by far here has been this move, with the idea of just playing here and then playing bishop here. And you don't expose your knight on that square. And you also haven't committed to taking. See, if you take, you're freeing this bishop. And that's really what white wants when he's got an isolated pawn, is real free attacking piece play. So one of black's ideas, wait a second before you take that play. You might might take it later, but you're playing this now. And now white has a lot of a lot of moves here. This is the famous old move, just stopping b5. And a lot of times white follows up with queen e2 and rook d1. I think those lines are okay for black. My impression is they're just fine for black. Um, I think by the way, was it Caruana that played? I should have looked this up. Someone someone recently played this. One of the best players in the world played this uh, queen's gambit accepted as black not too long ago, but it's still, it's been kind of rare. Now here's the thing I, I wanted to say about this. I think the big problem for some time now has been that move. That seems very innocent, but it gets you to one of those isolated pawn positions with a move that you're gonna make anyway. If, if black plays this natural move, which he does most of the time actually, white breaks up the queen side. Now that threatens to take this because that can't take back because the rook's hanging. And if black advances, then you play a move like this, and then you play for e4. And, and let me show you how that might work. Like even if even if black stops e4, um, you can even play it anyway at this point. I think is that right? Wait, let me see what I'm doing here. Uh, yeah, you can play this anyway. The point being, okay, there's two pawns. You're you're giving up one of two pawns. Black can grab one of two pawns. If he doesn't, white just advances in the center. But if black takes this one, this is uh, surprisingly difficult for um, for black. This is very, very difficult, in fact. Um, white's already much, much better. The, the problem is white's way, way too well developed. Um, if black, for example, simply tries to block this, there's problems with sacrifices on that square, then white can come zooming out here. And all his pieces out, and where are black's pieces? Plus black has some weaknesses here. So black has one pawn, but he's got all kinds of weaknesses. And if he plays there, of course, and then if you put a piece here, Bishop takes is going to win. Uh, if you put uh, your queen there, you're going to lose a piece. So there's these tactics that are really messy. You really don't want to put your king up if you can possibly help it. Probably the best move then is just here, winning your pawn back and attacking this. And then, you know, the things are getting really bad for black. But if the queen moves, where is it going to go to? Uh, it's just there's no good squares. Um, because of 95, for example, here would be another tempo. Anyway, all these things end up being really excellent for um, white. So, so that's one of the ideas. The other idea is, well, you could take there, but then white advances. And it turns out that even though he's temporarily pawned down, the, the fact that he has, he can defend that easily and bring a knight to a beautiful square there where it attacks here, it attacks here. There's a move a5 sometimes. The bishop can come out to g5 or maybe even f4. You've got space and attack. Now, it's true you're pawned down temporarily, but this has been shown to be very difficult for Block. If you want to get a some really a really good overview of this, um, Avruk's 1d4, I think it's the first volume, has a Queen's Gambit accepted uh, repertoire with Bishop b3, and most of that theory is still sound. Uh, so that's that's my opinion of why um, 
why this isn't, oh, I guess I showed this for a second, yeah, um, of, of why one of the problems that Black's had, I haven't really seen him solve this problem completely. Now, there are ways to play it, and people are still playing, but I just think white gets some advantage anyway. And it's also maybe a practical matter. You're getting attacked. It's, you're on the defensive, and you don't have that much counterplay, and most people don't like to play that way, even if they do think they can somehow get what's maybe a drawn end game or get some sort of equal game eventually. So that's my... Um, I think that's all I was going to say about the Queen's Gambit, except, it, except that, oh, and also I want to mention my idea that's in my book. You might want to just look this up. It's a really easy way to play. You play this move, which looks very odd, but it does cover the e4 square. It has the idea of e5, and it prepares to answer this with this. And now that's a very strong move now because you're threatening to take, and if he advances, then you can play a move like this, and you're ready to play e4, e5. Oh, sorry, e4, e5. And uh, even if he tries to just say, okay, no, I'm going to win a pawn here, then it turns out White's got quite an excellent game here. And White can also play fairly slowly in these positions, just have a big positional advantage. Uh, now, Black doesn't have to play b5. There's a lot of other moves. They're all in my book, um, a strategic chess opening repertoire for White. You know, I give all these typical options, and I give the isolated pawn positions and uh, all kinds of analysis. But it's, a, it's an awkward position. It's a, I love the system for white. I've done incredibly well with it. Um, very similar to bishop b3, actually. But I think in some ways it's, well, I don't know if it's better, but it, it's less well known and, uh, and it works pretty well. So that's, um, that's sort of an overview. And then I got a game in this week, and that's one reason I'm answering this question right now, is because um, I was kind of excited to see, yeah, someone sent me this great game that's just incredibly instructive. It's um, John Thomas sent me this game. It's between uh, Sokolov, Ivan Sokolov, and Nikolic from uh, actually 1993. It's in Ivan Sokolov's book, Winning Chess Middle Games, which I recommend highly. John also recommends it. It's uh, just a wonderful book. It is a funny name, though. You're not going to learn everything about the middle game. You're going to learn about the, a, few, a set of middle games in the pawn openings that um, Ivan Sokolov uh, goes into in great detail. So uh, the title's a little funny, but, but as long as you understand that you're getting Nimzo Indians and Queen's Gambits and Queen's Gambit, oh, that kind of thing, uh, Queen's Gambit accepted, and typical D-pawn structures, then uh, I think it's a wonderful book. Um, anyway, uh, he says that he came upon this game and Sokolov made the following comment. Let me show you the game first. Um, let me just... Uh, so it's, so it's a Queen's Gambit, but it's from a while ago. It's a little bit, not exactly irregular, but it's not the main line. Okay, we just looked at this. This is Black's counterattack in the center. He wants to isolate this pawn usually, but he's waiting. He plays this move a6 first. I just showed you that move. It probably is sort of, in a, a sense, objectively the best move. And interestingly, Sokolov plays the move I was talking about, uh, the bishop d3 move, which is not as common as other moves, but uh, I like it a lot. Okay, and black counterattacks the center. White plays in a sort of unusual move. I think the best move is just to go ahead and develop. Uh, but I mean, best is a funny word because the a3 is a fine move too. Um, and uh, and then just develop. And this is your ideal structure, just so you'll know. Uh, from both white's and black's point of view, you're going to want to know this kind of position. And then here you have um, either... Now here's a, a, a one of those rook issues. Where do the rooks go? I like to put them on e1 and d1 very naturally, but there are other ways to play. Uh, you can play, for example, at some point you might want to play, it's a little hard to describe, but, but if, if black starts attacking on the queen side, like either with this move or this move at some point, a lot of times what you'll end up doing is putting your knight here. You might want to leave your rook there to play f4, f5. I'd say that's a minority of games where that happens, but it's a, but it's a, something that definitely happens. Um, and sometimes you might want to put your rook on c1. My favorite thing to do is to put the rook on um, is to put the rook on e1, and then, for example, a position like this, you might play um, uh, this move. I guess I won't go into too much more detail, but but the the point is is that he can get a position, a static position with a pawn there that's not very good. So he probably wants to take, and the problem with taking is that then your knight gets into this little hole over here, and the bishop's still bad and you gained a tempo. It's just a little awkward for black. It's it's playable for black. It's not the end of the world, but it's a little awkward. Okay, so in this game, white played this move first, anticipating the idea that he might play. If black played slowly, he might just throw in this, and then here, and get his pieces out really quickly. 
these bishops are going to be very dangerous. It's going to be hard to castle for, for black without getting walking right into an attack over there. That's the idea. And this position, I believe, is favorable for white a little bit. So usually black doesn't allow that. Black says, okay, it's time to capture on d4 and isolate that pawn. And um, so that's why Sokolov showing this. This is your standard position. It's very instructive. This comes out of many, many openings. We've talked about this kind of thing before. Nimzu Indians, Karo Cans, uh, regular Queen's Gambits. What else? I'm probably missing. I know I'm missing a few things, but this position could come up. Uh, oh, Alep and Sicilians. When you play the Sicilian defense and White plays C3. Um, it's actually four or five more. There's even El Yakin's defenses, I think. Is that right? Well, maybe not. <laughs> but uh, there's strange openings that can lead to this kind of position. Okay, now there's an odd move. It's not the normal move, but it's interesting. Um, and black plays there. Black wants to be very careful about playing b b5. is probably a decent move, but it does get, it exposes more squares. For example, that square. A knight might end up going to that square at some point. Um, and um, it also maybe at some point allows the pawn to be attacked, and then black has to make concessions after a4. But it's a legitimate move. But this has also been played quite a lot. And um, now white plays here. And here's the question that John has. Um, Sokolov says, after rookie one, immediately, he says, this gives black a chance to carry out a, a known rook maneuver. Rook a7, okay, queen d3, rook d7, attacking here, bishop e3 to defend. And it's a little hard to see how else to defend that without retreating, which you don't want to do because you're the attacking player, or moving the rook for a second time, which doesn't make any sense, really. Um, so bishop e3 is natural, and then bishop e7, and uh, rook a d1. Then he gives the move g6. Um, so I have a couple things to say about that, this g6 move. Um, and also about why, why this is a good line. John's question for the record here, and I'm going to be looking at it. He says, perhaps I'm missing something. I can understand why black cannot attempt the same maneuver after Sokolov's move order. So just, so just to slow down a little, so show you what we're talking about. White plays this move, bishop g5, and, and instead of rook e1, he plays bishop g5. And the question is, why not rook e1, which has also been played in games, by the way. Um, and he's saying the reason is this rook a7 maneuver, and John is saying, why can't you do that against bishop g5 also? But first, let's just look at what happens one more time here. Okay, bishop comes here to defend, bishop b7, uh, rook a d1, g, uh, b5, right? Oh, uh, no, g6, excuse me. Okay, so... The basic answer is that the bishop's more passively placed here than on g5. That's that's one of the points. But the other thing I'd like to mention here is that since bishop, there's no bishop g5 threatening to take, followed by checkmate on h7, black doesn't really have to play g6. Black could play very slowly here. I think that's a better move, actually. And this position, I think, is, is dead equal. I don't see anything that white uh, can do here that's, that's um, particularly threatening. Let me see if I can... I can show that. Okay, I didn't I didn't put my lines in here for this. But basically the idea is you're going to just put your other rook over here and put more pressure on the center without creating any weaknesses. And if white plays there, well, he's kind of wasted a whole move. Now you play G. Now he's threatening bishop takes, followed by queen takes mate. So now black stops that. But now he's gained a move because white would have to move the bishop for a third time to play there. And then black would play here, and there's really no defending the center. White's just played too slowly here to get his attack going. So um, so he'd have to leave the bishop there, but that's not particularly effective. Okay, um, let me just, um, should we look at the game first? Um, yeah, let's, okay, so let's go back to the game now. In the game, white played this move first, and John's asking why not play rook a7. Black played uh, that move. And we'll look at that game. It's very instructive. This, these positions are wonderful, by the way, because you're going to get them from a lot of different openings. In your chess career, as time goes on, you're going to see them both as black and white. You're going to want to know how to play them. John's question is very good. Why not just go there and there anyway and put pressure on this? And my answer to that 
is that, well, white doesn't have to end up with a passive bishop on b3. So you play here anyway. Now, before black can get rook d7 in, you're, play, you're threatening bishop takes. For example, rook d7, bishop takes, whoops, white just won a piece because if black takes back, this is checkmate down here. So black has to play this first. And now if nothing else, white can play here. And opposed to, as opposed to the line we just saw, the rook can't go to d8. And if, even if it goes to e8, white's taken two moves with his bishop instead of three. He never had the bishop on e3. So it's a more active bishop. But let me show you a typical line here that probably would really happen. What would happen here is um, rook ad1 first. Might as well get all your pieces out. And this is also a question of where the rooks go. I should mention that sometimes this rook goes here. But usually that rook goes there when the bishop retreats all the way back. Right now, it's the bishop's kind of blocking that rook. So the rook goes here. This rook would go here. And now, uh, let me see what I give as being the easiest way for white to play this and why it's different. This move, black plays here. So he can play the same setup. You know, there's nothing really wrong with this. It's just a little more active for white than that setup. Now, I think a really good move now is this. Very strange looking move. But the idea is you're going to play this move, bishop h6 and then maneuver your queen over to the dark squares, but you don't want to be hit with knight up. And h3 is always useful anyway, because it creates an escape square for the king later. Um, and now what can black do? Well, he could make a number move, so I just gave an example. Um, uh, queen b6, or b5, sorry. And now I just give bishop here, rook here, and then bishop up here, a very standard move. Another very instructive move, I wanted to, Explain that. One idea is that once you get, you put the bishop here, you took great, at great lengths, you play bishop here, bishop back to c2, queen up to, th to force him to play g6. But the minute he plays g6, that's very solid over there. It's very hard to break down. So now you switch to this square. You've already weakened the king's side, and now you start aiming at that square. And that's actually a pretty good, um, actually, I think we made one move first. Yeah, I did. You didn't play that move first because he can be chased. So we played this move for stopping knight a5 and thinking about playing this next. And black plays here, a very natural move, targeting this and getting ready to maybe double rooks, uh, getting, getting the queen off the back rank. White plays here. Now you've got to really be careful about moves like rook takes e6, followed by bishop check, followed by knight up. It's very, very, it's scary. It may not work immediately, but it's, it's a scary sequence. And so black plays... Um, if black tries to come back and defend that and maybe get rid of the bishop, then the bishop comes back, attacking the knight, and then what happens is you get this e d5 move in, which is your other major break, is to break down this diagonal. When you play d5, you're freeing your rook and your queen along the file, and you're opening up uh, a square for the knight, and you're attacking, basically. So this position turns out to be almost winning. It's, it's just very difficult for um, black to hold this position. Uh, and I won't go into that. You can see this in various, uh, you can just play over the moves yourself and, and see what you think. There's a lot of games that have positions like this. So the main move now would probably be rook here. And it turns out this is probably only a draw if you sacrifice here with rook takes e6. But uh, you don't have to play that move. You can simply play a move like this, threatening bishop takes. And that's a huge threat because after pawn takes, queen takes, you're going to come down and basically checkmate black. Um, so probably the main move now is to play here to defend that, because it's hard to find other moves. Um, you know, if the knight retreats, you're just asking this knight to come in with attack here, and attack here, and attack the rook. But the problem with this move is now white comes back again and attacks the rook, and the rook can't move to defend this. And black can sacrifice the exchange now, but it just turns out white's a little better no matter what happens here. So... So that would be a typical standard way to proceed, explaining why it's better to have the bishop out there than it is back here in a sort of passive position. Now, black can probably play, I, I don't. I think it's a great question because I think this defense still is not that bad for black. He just has to play very, very carefully, this idea of rook a7. But at any rate, at least you understand why the rook a7, d7 is a little better for white than it is in the game, or in Sokolov's variation. Okay, so black actually plays this in the game. And white plays up. Ah, and there's John in the chat. You know, I haven't looked at the chat yet at all because for some reason it wasn't coming up at the beginning. Ah, here we go. Ah, I have chess philosopher. I have a question from you. Hey, Pear Eric. Hi, been there for a while. There's Moving Dutchman, who, by the way, played the game. 
that I talked about, and uh, did, I didn't know what his name was, so I'm getting, I, I corrected it this time if you didn't hear this. Um, the B5 line was played in Reykjavik and Black had good games. Interesting, okay, okay, and I will check those out and check them. I tried to show you what, which lines with B5 I thought were um, working well for white, but it could be that Black's improved on them. Um, have you ever talked about, okay, and I'll get to the other questions in a second, but that's a good start, that's a good introduction, and um, John Thomas is actually here, which is cool. That's He's on the uh, he's on the chat right there, John Thomas, an extremely well-known player, an experienced player who's been around, master player who's been around for many, many years and contributed a great deal to chess in his writing and his playing, so that's who we have, are honored to have his presence here. And this is his question, <laughs> and I hope I answered it. I hope John got, got the answer to that, and if not, you'll, you'll just have to replay it, I guess. But we're also in the middle of this game, this fascinating game, which is very instructive. Now, Black played this g6 move, and I explained why that was your threatening checkmate with queen takes h7. So you, so he makes this weakness, and white plays um, rook over. I mentioned that where, where the rooks go. Sometimes the rook will stay there. Most of the time it'll go there. Uh, black plays naturally onto the open file. One of Black's ideas is to play b5, knight a5, and knight c4. White plays um, the bishop up, and we talked about that. Once the g6 move has sort of blocked off that bishop, it moves to another diagonal where it's attacking there, and then there's sacrificial ideas, but it also supports the move d5, which can tear open the position. Okay, so Black plays b5, thinks that he thinks that d5 already isn't going to work. And that kind of makes sense because after d5, there very well might be a move with tempo attacking this square. I don't know if that's true though, because of d6. <laughs> so, but um, there's some reason why d5 might be a little bit too early to play. I suspect that's the idea. It could be that white's better here. It's it's very complicated. I'm not sure what's what's going on here, but white didn't think he was better, and it's probably not too much better. It's nice to have this bishop here before you play d5. So in fact, white plays bishop a2. Now d5 is probably a threat. And black puts another piece to stop d5. He's ready maybe to put a knight there. And he has this nice knight c4 blocking move. Okay, so white tries. Um... Oh, I wanted to show you too that maybe, actually arguably a better move might be that because if you take that, there's this great fork here. The, the, you can get rid of white's very strong attacking piece, the bishop on a2. Uh, after that was played, I think what you would find would be captures and knight e4. And the reason this is a little better for white is something I talked about earlier. One of the problems with b5 as opposed to b6 is that's a wonderful square for a piece. And I think you'll find that this is actually slightly better for white. Because if the bishop goes away from the, away from the king side, if the bishop goes to g7 or something, then this move's looking awfully good. But if the bishop stops knight c5, which would be a natural move, then I think you'll find d5 is, is a strong move. And positionally, things like this tend to be a little better for white. Not very. Sometimes black can just make some solid moves and equalize here. Right in this exact position, I'm a little worried because white has a lot of themes. One is to, if the queen moves out of the way, which it might do because of indirect attacks, uh, a knight can come here attacking f7. This this idea of queen, let's get those uh, let's get those arrows out of there. This idea of bringing the queen over here is also quite good. That supports a knight going to e, g5, but it also threatens queen h6. There's also moves like h4, h5. It's a tough position to hold for black. It might be okay, but it's not not fun. So that's why he doesn't play b4. On the other hand, what he does play works out worse. He plays here. Very thematic logical move, but it does allow white into the center. And now there's ideas of knight takes followed by bishop takes with a huge attack. Um, there's also, a, well, we'll show you some other ideas in a second. So black tries to simplify, probably not the best move, but we won't, I don't think I'll go into that. And uh, now white plays, just just takes a piece off. Um, now, now black's ready to play knight c4 and block off the attack, but he, he doesn't have that many moves because white manages to get that move in first. And that kind of break, extending the range of the bishop, often favors white. Sometimes it's just equal, but in this case, I think it favors white. Um, now, Chekhov, who's annotating this game, says that that's a good move, exclamation point. But he doesn't analyze this move. Notice that that pawn is pinned. 
and that move is is it's just very hard to meet. You know, a rook can start start transferring here for one thing. There's also just a threat of just taking that, the threat of bringing the other rook over. Um, I think the only move here really is f5. And he gave that move actually, so he did give this move. He did look at queen h3, but he just said black was equal here, and in fact black's in big trouble because now these rooks are so strong, and the king's a little weak, and that pin has to be released somehow. Uh, the king's been, been a little weak, and it just turns out no matter where he goes here, I mean, that move, of course, you get to the seventh rank. So really, the next move is probably forced, uh, which is queen here. But then you have this move threatening to get to the seventh rank with rook e7. And I won't go into much detail because we don't want to waste the whole show, but it just turns out this position's excellent. And one reason it's excellent is because there's this idea of just piling up on that square and winning that pawn because it's 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 pinned for quite a while now. Okay, this is not completely obvious why this is good for white, but if you look at it a little bit, you'll see that white almost always wins a pawn after this position. He has a, an attack and ends up winning a pawn. Um, okay, enough of that. Um, so what happens is he just takes that, which Chekhov doesn't particularly like. In fact, he gives it a question mark. But in fact, it's the best move, I think. And now there's really some problems. I mean, the minute you take this, you're, you're getting in big trouble because that knight is so powerful coming to these dark squares. That's really going to be almost really difficult to meet. Queen here onto dark squares, and you're really in trouble. So black covers those dark squares. That's a good move. That's probably the best move. Um, because if he, if he plays something like, well, just for example, if he plays here and you go here, even if he could defend that, he's got this problem, knight d6. And queen can't take because the bishop f7 check. These are typical uh, attacking themes after d5. So, okay, I, I'm going to go a little faster. So checks, he defends. White brings the other rook under an open file. Uh, and black takes. Is there anything worth seeing? I think he should probably try challenging the file. Uh, Chekhov says, this is, I think, before a lot of the computers were running. He says that just wins. But, um, in fact, I don't think it really does. I think you can just sort of hold on here. So it's not that bad. But but White's still better, and he's even better if he plays a move like this, I think. I think that's a really good way to play. Anyway, um, everything else tends to be really bad because of this move 94 coming. Uh, so what he tries is... Um, Yeah, let me just see. Okay, he tries that. And one of the ideas now is rookie seven check, obviously. So you've got to stop rookie seven check. He tries um, that move. Hansen, who's annotating this game, says that this move loses to rookie seven. <laughs> and once again, it's a computer thing. All this analysis, I think, is pre computer. That looks overwhelming because of the idea of takes check, but it turns out after takes check, it's not that easy. It's actually kind of a, it's just a fairly small advantage. It's good for white, but it's not overwhelmingly good. Um, black actually slithers out here, and, and there's some back rank issues. Now it turns out white's still uh, better here, I think, like, how does this work? Um, well, he has, to, he has to take the queens off. And he is a pawn up, but black's very active after a move like this. In fact, it looks completely drawn, but it turns out white can keep an advantage here if he's, if he's careful. Um, probably not enough to win, though. So that was the best. Uh, white wouldn't have played rook e7, probably, but instead he plays there. And now I think things are too late. I think the game's going to start ending here. Yeah, because that move's so good now. Threatening, just simply threatening the a pawn, but also threatening knight e7, which is really just winning material. So black attacks that, white wins the a-pawn, and I think I'll stop here. That's a big square for the knight. You're pawn up really for nothing. So I think I'll stop there because I don't want to take too much time on this. Let's go to the chat. I haven't even addressed the chat. Hi, everybody. Shidki came again. That's wonderful. Ears 61, wonderful. All these great people. You've all sent me good questions before, too. Have you ever talked about 1, E4, E6, B3? Yeah, I thought it wasn't you that asked about it. Somebody asked me about it. <laughs> Not, I think maybe even twice. Um, yeah, what have, we, what have I said about that as a question? One thing you can do that's a little unusual, this is a common idea that you know the old books give, and I, I don't know, I think white's kind of, this is kind of a fun line for both sides, but maybe more so for white. I mean, it's an interesting idea, even though the bishop's blocked off horribly. It's supposed to be equal, but it's worth 
think it, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't discourage me as wide. Um, obviously you can play here. Oh, I know I showed you some game I, that I analyzed with a, with a B3 fan where you played, you played very simply with D5 and C5. Um, but one other thing I think I showed you that I think is kind of interesting is uh, to play here. I think I give it in my book actually. And one reason for that is that it turns out that with B3 and here in, this is a little awkward to defend. It's, it's a little strange. You don't really want to play here. What was the point of playing this whole line if you're going to play that passively and block off all your pieces? But if you play here, you're sort of, that's not the idea you had when you played bishop b2, is to just block off that bishop. Well, I could play a Sicilian here, for example. Or just play knight f6. Um, probably the best move anyway. But there's no simple, you see how there's a problem there? And if you play there, you aren't even gaining a tempo, and you're blocking off your own bishop, and you're opening up his diagonal. Probably block's already better here, actually. Um, so, so that's a little trick that you can try. And obviously, white has things you can do against that. It's not the end of the world. The other thing you can do here, I think I tried once, had an interesting game with, was this move, with the idea of this. Maybe I played it next move, actually. Might have played it one move later. It's kind of interesting position. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I can't tell you too much about it. I think it's a total, totally legitimate move, but it's really hard to get an advantage with. Black has several interesting replies. A lot of the top players just play a Sicilian type structure. They just play like that. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, white can't play this way. It's, it's a typically, you know, it's a logical, you know, when you're white, you can afford a tempo. You can afford to, to, to make moves that you might not otherwise want to make, uh, just to get a nice active piece like this while black catches up in development, you're getting a, a well-placed piece. So I, I'm not at all down on B3 as a move. Hamilton played an interesting game with B4, F5, Amon. I used to actually, when Amon was very young, we I had lessons with him. Um, C4, knight of six, H4, no, 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 really? Oh my goodness. H4, E6, G3. Well, he's discouraged this. He might have been playing someone he knows plays this line, and that's quite a strong move as it turns out. Because after knight takes, which you better do, because otherwise everything's opening up, you have this cute little move. That threatens to take a piece, and he can't take back because of checkmate. And if um, if Black just tries to say defend against that, you know, like a move like this, you take and you and Black can't take back because the rook's ha the knight's hanging. And if he goes there, he loses material to that move. So e4 is quite a nice move there. Black would probably go back again, but then you can play either e5, which is pretty strong, or takes is pretty strong too, because positionally it works out really well. Takes followed by bishop g5. Anyway, it's kind of a cute idea. The only problem is why would anybody play g6? <laughs> and his opponent didn't. His opponent played e6 apparently, which is much more sensible. And white played g3. My guess is Amon knew who he was playing and knew he was an obsessive Leningrad player with g6, and so he decided to get him out of his comfort zone. Uh, I don't particularly like this move h4 this early. The other idea he has here actually makes sense. I shouldn't underestimate. Uh, Amon's an, uh, I believe he's an IM, but he's a very strong player. Um, one of his ideas is a Canadian player. One of the ideas in these lines is to put a knight on f4 sometimes. And in that case, that goes very well with a pawn on h4, both stopping g5 and threatening maybe to advance against a king. So maybe even here it makes a certain amount of sense to play this way because of this knight coming to here potentially, or, or and the other knight could come to f3, for example. But I don't know exactly what his ideas were or whether black played the classical setup or whether black played a stonewall setup. You have to know that to know more about the game. Great comment and really interesting. Um, what else do we have here? <laughs> Still here. What about a well-timed knight a5 in that line to prevent bishop b3 and tending knight c4? Yeah, I think that that's in that uh, queen. Very good question. That was in that queen's gambit accepted line. Usually knight a5 is met almost instantaneously by knight e5, covering c4 and attacking. That doesn't mean it's not a good move. It's, it's often the best move to play knight a5. So it's a good question. You Instead of b5, good point. Yeah, that that's a thought. Let me Should we go back to that? Is that worth it? Let, let, let's do it. Was it in this game? It was in this game, so we could actually get to that position pretty fast. Um, I think. Okay, that's where he played b6. And I was probably talking about some line where he played b5. Mm. 
this actually is my fault because I don't remember which analysis you're, you're talking about one of the analytical lines. And, but anyway, the idea of B5 and Knight E5 is certainly completely legitimate and is often answered by Knight E5. Um, that's about all I can say about that because I don't know the exact position anymore. Maybe I should be, um, and then the bishop is defending D5 exactly. That bishop on B7 will be defending D5. I should um, watch the chat a little more closely while I'm doing these things, and I apologize for that, John. Uh, you can send it to me as a question in, on email if you feel like it, and I'll uh, try to address it more carefully. Does anybody know a book by Konstantin Tsakiev? I certainly do. Bishop C4 in the Grunfeld. It's supposed to be absolutely excellent. John says, John Thomas is out of date now. I don't doubt that. Um, I'm reading Yelena Dembo's book, and she says it's a must-have. Probably at the time Yelena wrote the book, it was probably a must-have. I think it was the best. I, everyone told me it was the best book at the time on the Bishop C4 line, the Grunfeld. What we're talking about, by the way, is this line, um, the uh, the Grunfeld defense, which is this. It's always good for you to see these things, even if you don't play them. Just sort of to know how the, all everything breaks down in chess, what the structures are and what the openings are. It's good to know. It's good just to have on file. Um, this is playing, instead of playing moves like knight f3 and bishop e3 and rook b1, the things we've talked about, this is the bishop c4 line. This is where white plays here, and after black counterattacks, white plays here instead of playing knight f3. It's a tr traditional line, hundreds of thousands of games, wonderful, uh, famous, famous games. We actually looked at uh, uh, Fischer Spassky in this position, and we, we've, we've looked at this a couple times on this show, but not very often. Uh, the question is, okay, so Sakaev wrote a book about this, and um, it was considered the best book for quite a while. So I, I think um, I think it would probably still be worth having, is my guess, but you will get more up-to-date information by looking at the top players' games in these lines. My impression is just overall, Black's pretty happy right now in these lines. Very often, Black is now playing these lines with... Um, with, what do you call it, with queen c7 and bishop d7. So something like, um, maybe even bishop d7 right away is being played. Uh, or queen c7 with bishop d7, kind of a, a way of keeping the pieces on. You're still working on all the white squares on the queen side, is the idea. I don't think white's that thrilled with the bishop c4 lines these days. They seem to be pretty equal, and obviously black's very ready for them. Okay, here's another. We'll stick with the chat for a second. Is e4, e6, d4, knight f6 playable as black? Uh, let me see what we're talking about here. e4, e6, d4, knight f6. Well, I always think everything's playable, but that one's, uh, <laughs> that's going to be pretty tricky. What you have here is one thing you have, and there's other ways maybe to play this, but one thing you have is an Elyakin's defense, probably going to go to d5 but with the bishop already cut off. So you can't just play d6 and bishop g4 or bishop f5. And my feeling is that this is going to be very, very difficult. Maybe even just f4 now. Play a four pawns attack. You can also just play solidly here. Just play normal moves. White's got space, and, and black isn't getting his piece, that piece out. He's getting his other pieces out. Playable, probably, but difficult already. Probably not worth it. If you're going to play that way, why not just play the Elyakin's defense is one way to look at it. And just play here and then put your bishop. And that's just more flexible because now you can play. You could play e6 later, but you also have the option of getting this bishop out first somewhere. Okay, so I don't like the looks of it offhand. Um, it just doesn't seem to make much sense to me uh, to let yourself be kicked around unless you have active play. And active play to some extent means being able to get that bishop out. Um, yeah, I'd also be a little worried about a sort of a four pawns attack kind of thing. That looks very dangerous uh, for black. So, because there, because usually you get a lot of counterplay playing, again, here, followed by bishop up, maybe pinning in a knight here, and you get this counterattack in the center. But it looks to me like right here you're not going to get that big counterattack. So I guess I'm not. Uh, it's playable, I'm sure, but probably not particularly good. Um, Avrik's book on the Grunfeld, though more limited in its purview, is more up to date on the newly important lines. Absolutely, Avrik has a three three volume or two volume two volume, I guess, a thorough repertoire book in the Grunfeld. Um, Hamilton's opponent played a stone wall. He mentioned that G3 discouraged B6. <laughs> yeah, but B6 you wouldn't play anyway. Probably most people aren't going to play B6 there. Um, but it's true. It's true. G3 discourages uh, B6. Oh, I see. After after e6, okay. Okay. Is the Grunfeld 
good at a club level is I'm facing queen pawn openings every time I play as black. Whew, that's a great question. I've always thought the Greenfield was a little difficult on a club level. I have students who've played it and people who, you know, there's a point where it was the most popular opening in chess just recently. I mean, over the last few years. Uh, and, and one thing people as black discovered is there's so much material to cover. There's so many options for white. And a lot of them, maybe one problem with the Grunfeld is because white gets this space, black has to counterattack. And then once he counterattacks, a lot of times everything goes off the board and your winning chances go down. So it's a very professional opening. Um, classic opening, you know, favorite of Botvinnik and um, Fisher played it for a while. And then current players are playing it a lot. Of course, Fiddler is the great expert. I don't think it's much of a club opening. I don't know why. Just too much to know. And every time you have to face something new, and then you say, okay, well, next time I'll beat that, but I don't, I didn't study it enough this time. Um, interesting. John disagrees. He thinks, but I think John, things have changed. The white side of the Grunfeld has become really, because the Grunfeld got so important, people have specialty systems as white now more than they used to. Um, are you kidding? What are we talking about? Oh, oh, you guys are talking to each other probably, or talking to me. I think, I think Black, if he's played it his whole life, you know, then obviously he's going to be okay. But um, I have noticed, like some of my students took uh, Fiddler's series, video series, which is extremely good and extremely detailed. And there's also Avrik's book, um, and just started memorizing those lines and playing them, which is which is completely sound approach and a good thing to do. The only thing is they kept running into a slightly irregular move orders, and then they'd mess up. Now, you could say, well, that's just because they didn't understand the position well enough. Well, that's true, but there were so many positions to try to understand well. And they kept running into preparation that was not giving white the advantage by force, but giving black problems. And they found those hard to react to. Um, I, I think it's a, in some sense it's a little too difficult for a club player maybe a little too uh, flexible maybe 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 it's better to have more fixed pawn structures a little more fixed uh, or a little more predictable pawn structures even if they aren't that fixed just so that you can specialize and not have to face too many different lines purely my opinion folks I mean if you like the Grunfeld you know you can absolutely go ahead and play it let me get back to you know people send me so many things I shouldn't be ignoring them um, Alan asked an interesting question last week in the peers I'm still on the chat from last week there was a lot of stuff going on on the chat and uh, let me let me try and cover that because I think it's fairly easy to to cover um, as my headset falls off because I can't reach the keyboard all right um, I think it was this yeah he said okay this is a really simple question to answer it's kind of a tactical question but it also has a typical tactic that's good to know um, and that goes like this he asked about there's the Pirates defense, attacking e4, he defends e4, and black fan shadows. And this is the Austrian attack, the most aggressive line. And this is one of, you can just castle, but you can also play this very direct counterattacking line. White often takes, not always, but he often takes. And, um, and then you don't want to take back because that's a tremendous position. At, the end game is very good for white, so black pins the knight and threatens knight takes e4. And the question is, what about this move? Now we've looked. You and uh, we met, I've mentioned this move several times. It's a nice sideline for White. It's a very interesting line because um, the idea is to try to get Black to take this, and then White just moves over, and and you get this e5 move in, which is a real nice structure for White. Um, and here you can't play Knight takes e4 because of Queen takes g7. So that's an interesting. Now what he does in this game is this move. That's a little different because it allows this move. Knight takes e4. It looks like that's the first. That's what looks like is a problem. Um, the best move here is just to play what you normally play, which is queen takes, stopping from casting temporarily. Temporarily, And if white plays there, you go back, and now you actually can take this move very seriously. This, or is that right? No, you still can't. It still doesn't work. But you can, you're can. you thinking about just castling, playing knight c6, just playing normal, almost dragon-like looking, Sicilian-looking moves. And because the queen's on d3, the bishop isn't going to a particularly aggressive square, and this is considered equal. This position's considered... Now, that doesn't mean white can't play it. I mean, it's kind of fun. Um, the question last week was, I guess what happened is probably a fast game online. Uh, Alan's opponent, was it? Played... Um, oh, Alan played this, I guess. And uh, I just want to point out this tactic. It looks pretty good because of this idea. Taking and check. 
And Alan asked a question, which I'll, I'll get to, about this position. But right off the bat, I should say something he didn't mention, which is that move wins a piece, unfortunately. <laughs> it's a trick worth knowing. The queen is hanging. So whether you play knight c6 and let me take your queen or whether you take my queen, it doesn't really matter because whatever happens next is going to be knight takes e4 winning a piece. So it's unsound to play knight takes e4 in this position. However, he asks an interesting question. He says, well, what about this here, this position? Um, and... Um, let me just see here. And king here. And then black, if he's going to be a piece down, has to take this. And Alan asks if white has compensation here. And I think um, with, with for example, this move, because of the light squares. And I don't know if he has enough compensation. But I do think that this particular move order here, check first. And then, then playing here. And then when you do move the bishop, it's going to be with tempo on the queen a lot of times. I think this is extremely strong, uh, practically winning. I mean, the main line would be something like this. Now you're threatening checkmate. And if the queen comes back, the problem is you have bishop b2. The queen can't take the bishop because of mate. And if the queen takes the pawn, then you have a whole rook in the corner, something like, something like this. And white's bishop isn't really trapped. It can sneak out. At any rate, um, white pretty much wins that line, I think, or is anyway much better. So... But it was a great question because, okay, true, the, the literal question about whether knight takes e4 works is no because of queen b5 check. But you could also take this and have a very interesting counterplay. And that's a typical idea that when black goes around grabbing rooks in the corner and giving up his best bishop, you've got to be very careful of counterattacks. Okay, so now the next one I wanted to get to was... Um, Oh, I wanted to mention, I looked up my, uh, let me just do this without without putting a game up. Uh, I, finally, you know, I've been asked this question for a couple of straight weeks now about h6. And last week I mentioned what I thought the best line was. And um, one thing I didn't do is I didn't look it up in my own book. I'm, I'm one of the few people that actually wrote about uh, h6, even though I've never played it. So I don't really remember. This is quite a few years ago, too. Uh, I guess knight f3... I checked this out. I think the lines I gave in my book, Dangerous Weapons the French, and also the, just the practice since then, has confirmed that this is quite good for black. I mean, perfectly okay for black. Well, it's not worse, but but uh, so, I, so I think I was right about that. And then this line that was giving me so much trouble, I couldn't remember what I'd said. And what I said was exactly what we looked at. Now, as I mentioned, you can play bishop b4. That's one move. But this line that we talked about, going um, going like this... And then having white play this clever move, bishop b5 check, this is all in my book, and I couldn't remember what I said about it. Um, I still think that white is um, a little better here after this move, a6, but it's not quite as bad as I thought. Now, I mentioned that bishop takes isn't a very good move now, but I also said that I thought, oh, I'm sorry, I actually have black taking first. He doesn't have to, but that's it's a legit, it's, it's, it's as good as anything else, probably. Oh, and one other little trick, I'm sorry, I should mention, is that this move's not that bad, pinning that pawn. Because then when the knight goes back, um, it's defended by the queen, too. But I still think white's better. Um, anyway, the line we looked at last week, and maybe even the week before, was this. And I mentioned that I thought white was just better here. But um, and I, I go over some lines in my book with this. I actually continue this. I didn't realize this. I did a little analysis. And, and then black simply comes back and develops and castles. And it's a pretty solid position. I think white's better. I'm not going to claim he isn't better. Then I decided this week that even a little more accurate is just to play this first and worry about playing c5 later because he can't really stop it. So get developed. And one thing this position shows is that even when white has some really standard advantages here, which is you know more space, a cramping pawn. He's got this file. He's got... I mean, I like white here. I'd rather be white than black, but not by that much because black's position is so solid. Um, white probably is going to have to play something like this, get rid of his double pawns and sort of attack in the center, but but he's never... It's threat, Taking this is not much of a threat since it frees black's game. So you get positions like this, and black just castles. And, and I was just going to say, so that you could play this way against almost anybody and have a decent game, although I still think white's somewhat better because I like space. And and black doesn't have his usual counterattack that he has in the French defense. He can get it later maybe, but right now it's it's nothing. And his bishop is worse. White's bishops are better than this bishop here. 
but the pawn structure is such that black has uh, you know enough chances. So the only one reason I bring that up is first to show you what I think the best line is for white and what the, and how black might defend against it, but also just to mention that you know you can put together a repertoire still with this move I think and it'd be fun and and you'd be pretty happy with it. Most people aren't going to play into that line I just showed you and everything else looks pretty decent for black. So um, anyway, just for the record, let me get back to the chat for a second. Um, What's it going to open against knight of three that has a minimal amount of theory to play? What most people want to do because they don't want much theory, there is no direct line. I used to play this because I didn't mind playing a Sicilian defense. That's a Sicilian defense there, right? That's the same thing as having played uh, e4, c5, knight f3. Um, I used to play that a fair amount. Um, but then you do have to be able to play against a Sicilian, and you also have to play against an English defense, symmetrical English. Or you have to play against just a King's Indian attack kind of position, which can turn into all kinds of things later. It can turn into a King's Indian kind of position for white, or a Grunfeld kind of position for white, or even a regular D4, or a ready. Or so you're going to have to learn a lot in any case, probably after Knight F3, uh, C5. Uh, people's favorite answer now, I would say, it sort of depends what you play. If you're a King's Indian player, for example. Maybe you want to play knight f6. That stops any transpositions to um, e4 openings. And if white, no matter what white plays, you can probably just go ahead and play a king's Indian setup. Whether he plays d4, whether he plays c4, whether he plays g3, you can just play your king's Indian setup. And at some point, he probably has nothing much better than to play d4, going back to a king's Indian, or a king's Indian attack himself, which is very slow and easy to play against. Um, so that might be a good answer if you're a King's Indian player. If you're, and also what else can what else can happen after this that you might want to know about? Nothing particularly special. If you're a let's say a Queen's Gambit player, then you probably want to play this move, and that is the most popular move on the professional level right now. Yeah, here we go. D, D5 and C5 is almost universal against not one knight of three. That's absolutely right. That's your pretty much standard rephrase. Does does D5 and C6 typically work? Yes. What openings would I need to study to play this competitively? And that's what I was about to get to, is you wanted to not study much. And the reason I didn't immediately mention d5 and c6 is because you do have to know the Queen's Gambit. You know, White's going to play this next, right? You have to know the Queen's Gambit. You have to know the London system. So so if you're going to play d5 immediately, then you, you, you don't just have to know the King's Indian attack is black. You don't have to just know this bishop g4 stuff. Now you can play it right away, or you can play this first. Uh, he's talking about, this is the, the universal system they were talking about. They're talking about playing just this way. And there's all, and this breaks into, yeah, this is very popular now at the GM levels. And uh, it's always been popular. It's always been played quite a lot. But, um, and this has always been Black's favorite response in my, even in Swiss systems over the years. You look at Grandmasters, they tend to play this a lot. And then they play Knight D7 and E5 if they can get it in, or E6 and Bishop D6 and then E5 if they can get it in. Um, but what was I going to say about that? Oh, yeah, but those players are perfectly happy with a d4, d5 opening. I mean, after all, now you have to learn d4, d5 openings. So, yes, it typically works, but you would have to study the Queen's Gambit. No theory in the Sicilian. Yeah, I just mentioned c5 because it was a good example of how you have to learn other things. You, you can't just learn this stuff. And uh, by the way, this is this is the line that I thought was fun. When the knight's already on f3, I enjoy playing these positions. I think I think they're fun for black. It's good. You can get initiatives really quickly as black, whereas most openings against knight f3, you really can't. Um, okay, here's somebody, uh, Tomak, who uh, we talked about his question earlier, uh, mentions um, knight f3, knight f6. Uh, G3, if G3, yeah, B5. This is a case where B5 is definitely playable. It's been around for years and years and years. And, um, yeah, and I, I think uh, it's sound. It's a sound system for black. Um, a fun system. But, of course, White's not afraid of it either. There is that. Here's John Hartman. John Hartman, the chess life reviewer and uh, organizer and great player. Well, good player. Right, John? Um so what else do we have here? Besides Kasparov, Smyslov, my hero, Korchnoi Fisher, who currently plays the Grenfeld. I don't know. Is this a question? Um, 
Well, they all play Grunfelds, yeah, and you can you can study their games. By the way, speaking of studying games, I want to repeat what I said last week, maybe with even more emphasis. We talked about what to study to improve. Same old thing, because uh, you have to study. You're not going to get better unless you both play a lot and and study. And uh, I mentioned that you should really be addicted to, if you can be, or obsessive, or at least love what you're studying, and that was more important than anything else. And I think that really applies. You know, people talk about how, you know, strong players, the first thing they did is they learned all the classics. And I think that's that's wonderful. But then sometimes kids don't get much further because they're bored with the classics, so they don't want to play over some old Steinitz games or whatever. And, and, you know, it really just comes down to that. If you love playing through older games, uh, and want to play the old world championships and the old great tournaments, you're going to get a, be a much better player. If you, if you love playing those games, you play them again and again through them, you're going to get much, much better. Actually, that's how I, I started out with chess, was playing older games and playing through the old masters. It's really the only literature I had, actually. And um, and there's no question that's one way to get good at chess. But if you find yourself that you you just want to study openings instead, I would say, and you're really excited about them, you want to work them all out, I'd say you're going to learn just as much, uh, maybe even faster, because you'll probably correspond more to modern chess, the kind of thing you'll see in actual tournaments um, if you study end games. If, if all you did was study end games, practically nothing else, you'd be amazed how much better you would probably get if you just studied end games. I mean, you need to know a few openings. you got to survive the opening, right? But um, there's almost no question that if you love them and you are excited by them and you immerse yourself in them, you're going to gain a lot of points just studying end games because they have to do with the logic of chess, the basic logic of chess. Plus, you need to know your endings. Uh, but it's not so much that because when you're starting out, you're not going to get many endings anyway. But you're going to learn how the pieces coordinate and move and what wins and what doesn't win and how. So just to emphasize what I said last week, I mean, there's a reason that so many young kids do nothing but study openings and they've gotten so good. They get to be 2,600. It's a, you know, they just zoom straight up just, and they're basically studying nothing but openings and playing a lot online. And it's, it's not because they're just studying openings as much as it is. It's because they love studying openings and they, and they get tons out of it. They learn how to play the middle games that are related to the openings and they just get obsessed with chess and dig into chess. And that's the key. I don't care how you do it. You have to you have to want to do it because otherwise you're not going to enjoy studying. And if you don't enjoy studying at all, if you aren't really fascinated by what you're studying, you won't do as much of it and you won't be as good at, and you won't learn as much because you won't be kind of as connected with it. So I'm going to emphasize that one more time that that maybe more important than what you study is is how, how into it are you? How excited are you about it? OK. Um, and I don't think that's said often enough. Um, okay, a good player might be stretching it to a uh, filler question. My hero is tall. Uh, opening knowledge, my hero is <laughs> Mir Sultan Khan, who, although I guess the things he played, he played well, right? An outdated book by Tony Costin on the filler was good to read. Sure, yeah, you're going to learn things out of that. I think I think Tony would admit there are more unsound lines uh, in the Philidor counter gambit. <laughs> there's there's several I think almost refuted. Very few openings are re refuted, but I think the Philidor counter gambit is one of them. And Tony, by the way, is a great writer and a very good player, and uh, he runs the chess publishing site, which I'm always recommending. Um, Hamlet's game against Shiroff was great. I didn't see that. You'll have to you'll have to send it to me or show it to me, um, or ask a question about it. Okay, let's keep moving. We got all kinds of great stuff to show here. That was the Thomas game. We have so many things from older older weeks. I've got some games to show by people who sent me games, and we're already running out of time. Let me see if I can do something fairly simple. Um, ooh, the the H4 H6 and the Chatard attack. I have a high rated example of that. Um, Maybe I better get to a really older one, though. Yeah, we're going to look at that Eliak and Chatard attack in the French. Um, another really old French question I got from quite a long time ago has to do with the Portish hook variation. That I he says you recommend this in play the French fourth edition, but the win rate for players over 2,000 Elo is about 57% for white um, since about the year 2000. What what is the line white is using? This is a very old question, by the way. I'm sorry I never got to it. But I thought I'd show a game, because this is maybe inspiring to people who want to play against the French, and what can go wrong in the French, and and how much fun you can have on the white side of French's. Um, 
but also uh, maybe it will if you play this line it'll it'll show you maybe what you should be doing for black um, and we'll make this the last game we go over this is Caruana versus Neroditsky from the US Championship this year okay it's knight c3 which is what I used to play I still think knight c3 is the most fun and it's objectively great I mean it's really a great line to play um, and that's what I always played as white okay there's the winner which I also played as black of course and here's the main line and here's the line that um, he's talking about he's talking about the uh, sorry oh this is a chess philosopher by the way is it no 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 who asked this question I don't remember who asked this question um, I got it by uh, by email by the way can you please answer which one my Philidor question uh oh uh oh was it about the Philidor counterattack uh, okay hang on Thylophil uh, da, da, da. wait it just says hi did you send me one I don't think you sent me one you may have to send this to me because I don't see it offhand on the chat I will give it a priority I promise you but I don't think I can answer it now because I don't even see it oh here we go what's the best way to play against the filter central attacks filter a good opening for black um, that's not the filter central attack though that's just a, a basic filter um, but I would be glad to answer that now do I want to answer that now or finish what I'm doing how about next week hopefully thylophil you'll be here next week I'll definitely get to that okay because there's a time issue I just noticed unfortunately alas it'd be so much fun to just do this forever but anyway this is the so-called portish hook variation you attack this by I, I named it the, <laughs> the portish hook variation actually in honor of William Hook. portish played it and uh, William Hook uh, specialized in it he played a famous game as Fisher and then wrote about it actually wrote about the opening anyway you're attacking that white plays there and black plays here stopping that pawn from moving covering that weak square and attacking the D pawn and um, the question is what is white doing against it now for, for a long time most players as white seem to be playing that move threatening bishop b5 check and trying to force black to close the position and then white would return to the king side and play it whoops sorry and would play all sorts of king side moves and try to attack over here where things are weak especially that the dark squares uh, that line I'll just say I think is doing very well for black it's been doing just fine for black for a long time you can look at my book uh, play the French 4 has a, a chapters on the Queen H4 line uh, you can also look at anybody else's book or or practice or games um, the line that that I would probably play as white and that's been bugging me and that is scary to play against is this move which is what Caruana played and now in my book I give both g6 and king f8 I think g6 is a little underrated people just don't want to weaken their their dark squares you can see why but it has a lot of advantages the queen the king can still go queen side and um, and then you can attack on the king side uh, so even though you've got that weakness there's some good things about it by the way you're, you're attacking this pawn too now so that's that's nice uh, but still this is a much more common move and one thing interesting about g6 is later on black often plays this now <laughs> waste time but I, I won't get into that anyway so the point is this pawn looks like it's threatened but what white does here and I like this line a lot is he just develops and says go ahead and take this and I'm going to attack this is Caruana's white by the way and this line kind of has been driving black crazy now Narodiski I don't think is normally a French player and if he is I don't think he's ever played this line before because he plays a definitely inferior move already now in this line which is this move it's a logical move it's a move that everybody plays to get that good bishop off the board and leave white with a bad bishop but it's slow white's already way ahead in development so you got to be really careful about making slow moves barely playable I mean you're gonna get the worst game the right moves just for the record a 97 one it's it's been played quite a bit and then the other move is obviously important it's taking this pawn and I think people have been thinking that white's better here for a long time but I'm not so sure I do analyze this and play the French 4 as one of the options for black the main line is here and then black plays here and white simply takes this because he doesn't really have anything better and uh, and now this move and I think this white has plenty of compensation for a pawn here because he's got three pieces off and he's opening some lines and he's got two bishops with open lines that sounds like more than enough for a pawn but really if you look at it I think I and I probably won't show any lines here but I think black has, can fully equalize here e even this move by the way which is not the main move the main move is DC4 I think um, even this position the Knights are actually as good as the bishops well, well, you know black white has some weaknesses here and white can just play this move f6 
and then get his pieces out and play b6 and go for coverage of that square and the file. And I, I would never say black's better, he just isn't. I mean, the two bishops are always important advantage. But I think black's okay here. Black stands fine here. Um, anyway, that's that's one way to play. The, in other words, maybe you can grab on c2. There are other ways for white to try to play this. But, uh, but remember that after queen c2, a lot of times you'll be able to play queen e4 check, take the queens off, and then just develop your pieces. Um, that's simplified, but it's something to think about. Uh, in this game, he played this b6 move, and white played that very nice move, just attacking the center immediately and getting things out. Now on bishop a6, there's going to be this, well, a couple good moves. One you can do is just go here, threatening knight here, which attacks everything. That's a very good move. Uh, you can also just take this. It's a good move, too, because if he takes here, which is the natural move, um, then I think this move is very strong. You're a piece down, but you're threatening queen f5. You're threatening queen a4, winning a whole rook. And there's a whole bunch of tactics. There's ways for black to try and defend this, bishop d5, for example, but it turns out white is much better here. Okay, so, so he doesn't fall for that one. He plays here, better move. And um, white plays here. And now he makes, now his last chance is to get developed, get another piece out. But he plays one more bad move, which is here, even though it gains a tempo. And um, it just turns out to be that this move is just way too strong. Um, and in fact, oddly enough, Caruana didn't play this way. This position is just just looking awful for black. White's way too hard, hard far ahead in development. It has a big attack on the king side. Um, so you have to take my word for that. He didn't play that, though. So I might as well show you what he actually played. He played there, which in this pawn is pinned now, which isn't quite as good. Even though white's better here, um, black, black played slowly and retook. He needed to get pieces out. If he played that move, he's still in the game. This, this It turns out white probably tries that with a big attack. And, but if black plays accurately here, um, okay, maybe white's a little better, but it's very complicated. Uh, instead, black took back, and you'll see how, why the French is so much fun for white if you have a big lead in development like this. Knight up, great move. Now there's not much to do. Um, the problem is there's, there's bishop e4 coming, there's queen f3 attacking mate and the rook. So if, and if black plays bishop b7, then I think this move pretty much wins, because you're attacking that, and if white comes back to defend it, you have check. And then you just can take this and play check and just wipe him out. Uh, and if he plays knight f5, I think you just take that. It looks killing to me. Um, is that right? Yeah, this move, maybe even an e6 move now would be strong. Yeah, because you have queen queen c7 coming. You have taking here. This is just absolutely awful. You can even castle queenside in positions like this. Oh, you also have bishop e3 attacking here. Anyway, we're getting to the end of the thing, so let me not take too long on this. So black tries to stop all that by attacking the knight. The knight checks, uh, and I think black takes that, right? Yeah, it probably has to. Um, is there any option there? Not really, because where is the king going to go? Whoops. Sorry, I'm going backwards here. Sorry, what is wrong with me here? Ah, oh, sorry. OK, so 97 check. Uh, if the king goes here, unfortunately, we have this move threatening checkmate, and rook takes doesn't help because bishop takes is with check. So he has to sacrifice the exchange now. And white is still, the problem is black, black should be, if you're going to sacrifice the exchange, you want to be way ahead in development or have some tremendous outposts, and he doesn't have either one of those. So at this point, um, Caruana just gets his pieces out. Look, every, every piece is going to be active here. And he wins very quickly. Now he's threatening bishop c5, which is very hard to defend. Um, let me see. Okay, all the pieces are active. Look at this. Now you're attacking this. You have two bishops. You have open lines. Black plays f6. I don't think it makes any difference what black plays. Now the easiest move now is to play here. Whoa, sorry, is to play this move. And uh, it just turns out this is absolutely overwhelming, this position here. Um, but uh, what he does is fine, too. What he does is this move, attacking the e6 square, and black defends it, and white plays, 
there doubling and now you could just play you could play f4 here followed by rook takes d5 but he just plays it safe this is not the easiest way to win, but, but maybe it is easiest. Maybe that's the point. Carolina knows he's winning, so he doesn't care if he plays the absolutely optimal way to try to win. Oh, and, and Nerodesky tries this clever little counterattack. The problem is there isn't that much else to do. He's, he's kind of desperate here. So he does sort of a last gasp thing. Plays here, hoping for rook takes mate, obviously, but also hoping to have a threat on the rook. Queen takes d1. But after check, everything's with check. And it turns out that now the rook is protected, which means that he can simply, the square d1 is protected, so the next, so black resigns, because whatever he does, you're going to just take that, and then there's no more mate. Anyway, cute game, fun game. Kind of shows you this open, wonderful, you know, swashbuckling kind of get all your pieces out style for white that I used to like so much when I was on the white side of the French. And naturally, being a big French fan, I know that you can't get positions like that if black plays perfectly and or plays well. But but it's still worth seeing these things once in a while. Kind of an ideal thing. Uh, and I will get to that Philidor question. I promise. I promise. Um, could try it now. How much time do we have? Oh, a little bit late. 20 minutes ago. Thanks. <laughs> I, I will. I'll get to it. Sorry. Uh, I prefer the Caracan to the French. Well, OK. Um, uh, I don't like that. Sweet fiend shadow your bishop on g7 or not. That's in what? I don't know what that is, what that comment is about. All right. Okay. What did I miss here? I recommend studying Ullman's games to learn the French. It's quite enjoyable. Yes, I, it's a wonderful uh, book. Ullman has a book, My Best Games. It's in uh, two editions, I think, in English. It's originally in German. Might be two editions there, too. And... Um, just incredible games, has all the great French ideas. He plays, of course, he played these great players. Ullman was in the candidates. He has wins over Fisher in the French. I mean, this is, you know, top level stuff, wonderful stuff. Um, and Ullman over the years played all kinds of different variations of the French too, which makes him interesting that way. He was one of these one opening players. Um, I don't know how many of those there are these days, but uh, quite a few still, I think. Okay, as white, when I f place the French, I play the advanced version with queen g4. Next week, can you tell me what you think of it? I certainly can, Solomon Kennedy. So we've got a couple of questions already for next week. Um, and I would uh, thank everybody for coming on. Be sure you send me things. Uh, ask I am Watson at, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> chessclub.com. Lost my thought there because I'm looking, I'm still looking at the, uh, the chat. I guess I missed a few things on the chat. Um, I entered the Isle of Man Masters and finished one of nine, eight losses and one by. The Isle of Man, Man Masters, that's no disgrace. It's a, full of players that are incredibly serious and willing to put a lot of money into going. A lot of GMs, IMs, uh, just keep plugging away. I mean, that's how you learn the most is from your losses. That's what they say. It's true. It's hard to uh, put up with because it's so depressing, but it's, um, it's a great way to learn. And it's like it's true in any sport. Uh, it's easy to say, "Oh, Joan, don't worry, you just win. You learn from your losses." But it's so hard to lose. Losing hurts. And uh, all I can say is, well, well done that you didn't drop out, that you played it out. Isle of Man is beautiful, from what I gather, and I'd like to go there myself. Maybe I'll think about trying to get there myself and play. Um, maybe even this year. I know my friend Jim Tarshan has played there several times, and. Um, just loves the tournament. So uh, way to go, Alan. I mean, way to stick it out. That's that's how you're going to get better, for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, that's about it. And thank you. And I'll uh, talk to you next week. Don't forget to send questions or at least prepare questions for the chat. Bye-bye.